Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to my friend and fellow Gemini, Sharon Hewitt Rowlett. Sharon has a PhD in philosophy from New York University, and she's a philosopher and writer who focuses on extraordinary human experience. She taught at Brandeis University for two years before retiring in 2010 to focus on her own research and studies. And her first non-academic book came out in 2019. That was called The Source and Significance of Coincidences. And in 2020, she published a really heartwarming and just amazing memoir called The Supreme Victory of the Heart. So welcome, Sharon. Uh, one of the, the things that people most want to know about astrology is, does it work? And uh, the other thing is kind of like, well, what's our free will in all of this? And so I just thought, what a great opportunity to have you on to look at things from more of a philosophical angle, but also with all your background in researching coincidences and synchronicity. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me on, Laura. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Great. And, so, and this is one of my favorite topics too, by the way, which uh, you may not have known when you asked me to come talk to you about, <laughs> about destiny and synchronicity, but um, uh, uh, destiny is just one of these things that has always fascinated me. And so I'm, I'm so excited to get to talk to you about it today. Wonderful. So why don't you start uh, by sharing kind of how did you get into this line of research? Because it's kind of an unusual area of research. Well, uh, yes, uh, and I certainly didn't expect to go into it. Uh, when I left academia, I really had no idea that this is what I was going to end up doing. Uh, I didn't really even know that like parapsychology existed. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, explore creative writing and and all these things that you couldn't really do uh, within a full philosophy department. But then about six months after I left academia, I actually had this long series of coincidences that led me to some books about parapsychology um, and really opened my mind to all of these other ways of exploring the interaction between the mind and the world. Because that's, that's one of like the central issues within philosophy is this idea of that interaction. Um, and, you know, it, they tend to think of it in terms of the mind interacting with the body, but I think it's so much more than that. The, the mind is able to interact with the world in all these other subtle, interesting ways. So once I learned about that, that just, I, I mean, I, I couldn't stop researching it and researched it for, I guess, it, I guess I left academia in 2010 and then uh, the coincidence book came out in 2019. So that was like nine years of nonstop research and, and deep thought about this and and lots of other coincidences in there in between. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's how I got where I am now. Okay. Yeah. I recently watched one of your talks at Rice University where, and, and I found this fascinating. So I, I came to astrology through doing medical intuitive work and it just, I gradually started noticing that there, there were what I call, I would sense it as kind of like a window of opportunity, kind of psychically like, oh, there's an opening coming for you. There's something happening over here in this time period, but you could catch it again in this time period. And what I discovered was that it, those were transits, like those were outer planets and, and inner planets that I was sensing. And same thing with people's life paths. I was basically kind of downloading their birth chart in my head as energies rather than as, you know, well, this is Mars and this is your moon and all of that. But what I found so fascinating about your talk was this idea that um, our influence over our environment is kind of similar to like how we operate our bodies, that it can be largely unconscious and yet there there is this correlation. So do you want to share a little more about that line of research? Sure. So the, the core idea there is that when we have an intention or a desire, that intention or desire is sort of directly, holistically effective in, in the world. Uh, so 
usually the easiest way for our intention to be realized in the world is for our body to like move and do something to bring it about. So that's usually how we see our mind interacting with with the world is through our body. But in cases where there are obstacles to that, um, whether those are like external obstacles or we're just in a, a, you know, a really difficult situation where it seems like nothing we can do will fix the problem or whether it's something that's actually a problem with the body. Um, if we have a, a, a medical issue or, or even a, a mental issue, uh, people, um, for instance, people with autism tend to have more of these experiences of influencing the world in a psychic way um, or getting psychic information because they have difficulty communicating in the way that a lot of other people do. So they use uh, more frequently these other ways of interacting with the world. So whenever there, we have these barriers, uh, we start to see these more paranormal or anomalous ways of bringing our intentions about um, but really, I think it's it's actually a very normal way. This is the way that the world always works, the way our intention always works. Um, but we're just so used to our bodies, you know, normally working for us that that we don't think about it as being, you know, paranormal. Yeah, well, and that brings up an interesting point. So uh, for those people that don't know, I had a life changing traumatic brain injury in 1998. And I was very intuitive as a kid, you know, all along, but then after, and it's, I'm noticing it's 11, 11 right now as I'm talking about this. Um, I was very intuitive all along as a kid, but then after the brain injury, it was like, all of a sudden things didn't work as easily. And, mm. and I did notice like a huge uptick in my influence over my environment and I, I find that that is true for a lot of people, especially if something happens where there's like a glitch with the brain, whether it's Lyme disease or a brain injury yeah. or just such an extreme period of stress that like there's a breakdown or some other disruption of the normal does seem to increase the paranormal. And a lot of times too, I think um, people who are living in abusive situations, especially children living in abusive situations where they're not able to rely on their environment in a predictable way, they have to access these other ways of um, uh, controlling or understanding their environment. So those, those psychic pathways get reinforced in those mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I, I've noticed the same thing. And and really in my own life, I, I actually admit that like I had very chaotic childhood. And I think one of the reasons that I'm as psychic as I am was just like trying to not be blindsided. It's like, okay, yeah. what's coming up next? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm fascinated by something you were saying a minute ago about how you you came to astrology after already intuiting that there were these periods uh, where the you know energy was stronger in certain cases and it were more propitious to certain kinds of events. And then it's like astrology gave you a name or vocabulary for what was happening and also a way of sort of more objectively seeing when those periods were going to come around again. Uh, and I, I think that's fascinating. Yeah, for me, it was hugely validating because I, after my brain injury, like I lost my rational side for four years officially, but, you know, some people would argue that it never came back. <laughs> so I think it's come back and astrology kind of gives me that balance. But prior to the brain injury, I mean, I was on an academic track, same as you, uh, English literature, not philosophy, but I had studied a lot of philosophy as background to that. And I just, you know, I didn't believe in astrology. I thought it was just like this very ridiculous thing. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started doing so much intuitive uh, work and then also life path work for people and coaching that I just started noticing certain patterns. And I think the first thing was Mercury retrograde. I, I started noticing like all my clients who had nothing in common were all having these you know, eruptions of arguments and misunderstandings and missing emails all in the same period. And I mentioned it to friends of mine who were astrologers and they were like, well, duh, it's Mercury retrograde. <laughs> so that was the first thing I started tracking. And then I, I just, I got more and more into it, started studying the North Node as, as kind of like a shortcut for people if they're very, very sick 
and like the linear healing process would take, you know, many years, I found, well, if they just start kind of moving in that north node direction, then more doors open and these opportunities for spontaneous healing will often occur. And it wasn't until I really started looking at key events in my own life and then doing the transits for those, you know, in retrospect that I was like, oh, oh, okay, that was Pluto energy. Oh, that was Neptune. Okay, that was Mars. And I just started, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm kind of nerdy with the astrology. So. That's wonderful. Because it's something so. that I, I know very little about, but I love hearing you talk about it. Um, I, I watch your YouTube channel a lot. And I really enjoy hearing you describe how you understand those energies and how they, you know, interplay with, with world events and also, you know, can interplay with personal events. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I guess one of the questions that comes to my mind when I'm thinking about uh, destiny related to astrology and also related to individual people's lives, um, something that comes up a lot in my work, um, research on uh, people's memories of life between lives, um, people's memories of creating life plans um, in particular, and people having a memory of, you know, there are certain things that are supposed to happen at certain points in my life. Like, I I wonder about the interaction of those things. So I've never I've never specifically heard somebody say, you know, when I was in heaven making my life plan, like we were, you know, looking at the astrological transits and deciding what these different things. I've never heard that, but I wonder how those things play together um, when uh, when we're creating this sort of overall design for the life that we're going to live. Um, does is is the astrology already sort of a background to that do they just sort of is it something that is like intentionally thought about or do they kind of naturally mesh as as this plan is created do you have any thoughts about that I, you know, honestly, I don't know. All that I can say is that astrology continues to just blow my mind when I, when I look at certain events or especially people will do a lot, like they'll have me do family astrology. So they're having issues with their mother or with their son or something like that. And I'll pull the charts and, and the charts make it so obvious like, oh, these are dynamics that you came here to work on together. And I've, I've done a lot of fertility work as a medical intuitive. And so I was already very aware that, that certain souls would kind of target certain parents. And mm -hmm. it, in some cases, there's a very, very karmic experience that was definitely wanting to play out. And I would get the set like I'd have a whole personality profile of the soul and it might take the people a long time to get pregnant but when they would get pregnant and then you know I would do the chart it it would play out exactly what I was sensing of the personality so that would imply some kind of intentionality of like what is the timing of the birth if you're wanting mm -hmm. to work out these particular things mm -hmm. and then the other thing that I notice is that for a, a lot of times like the most difficult issues that sort of plague a family they'll all be centered around like one point in in astrology so like 20 leo or something or or like you know one family will have all aquarius moons or it, it's just like i notice the patterns and that would imply that that on some level there there's some arrangement but what i don't know and what i don't know how any of us really can know is does this like, do we sit in the heavens and like look at the astrology charts? Are we all astrologers? <laughs> or is everything just so cosmically organized that it's like, well, you you want to have this experience. This is the right time for you to be born. Yeah. Yeah. Because so connecting this to what we were talking about at the very beginning about um, me talking about like our intention just being sort of effective without us having to think about how it comes into being. It's just that like, the universe finds the the easiest way to actualize our intention and maybe that's sort of what's going on here is even with you know those intentions that we create um in that that other realm that you know we don't have to figure out exactly you know 
the precise second at which we should be born and all of these things, but that once we've created the intention for the life with this certain kind of arc to it, these certain kinds of challenges, then it manifests at a particular time because that's the time when those things will line up most perfectly. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's my sense. And that goes back to this earlier work that I did before I was actually actively studying astrology. And that was what I was calling timeline jumps. And the easiest way to explain that is, is that movie Sliding Doors. Did you ever see that? Mm -hmm. with yeah. Ultra? Yeah. So there's, there's two basic timelines that are operating right in one in the, in the very beginning, they're established where she, um, you know, loses her job and in one scenario she catches the train home and another one she just misses it and then you kind of track the two different versions of her and throughout that movie like there'll be certain places where she is in the same place at the same time but she's doing different things but it's like on some level like she's meeting up there and and that's kind of my sense too is like if you I mean, you can do a birth chart for a chair, right? And and like a chair <laughs> could be born at the same time as you were, but the way it expresses its destiny is going to be a little different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But my experience is that because I I'm weird like I I run a chart for everything so I mean I buy a new laptop I'm like oh what time did it arrive okay let me see what this does and it, and it does play out that that there's like a message in there and you find oh this had more to do with something that I wasn't you know even thinking that it did but the astrology kind of clues you in so but the the idea of these timelines and and like at certain junctures. Um, it's easier to cross the timeline. It's easier to jump. And I feel like that's because there's these highly charged moments where there's like all this energy. And it's usually what I find, it usually involves either your natal North node or the transiting North node crossing over one of the points in your chart or some kind of exact like zero degree, zero, zero minute aspect that just hits with an outer planet or you've had a longer transit going on with an outer planet, but then something short, like the moon comes by and it's like ping, like right at that same moment. And that seems to just like electrify the universe or something and mm. more possibilities open up in that window. Very interesting. So yeah. have you come across any, like when, when in your research, have you found, especially, I, I didn't mention in the introduction that Sharon has also, uh, she won a prize with the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness. And um, it was looking at the, the best evidence for the survival of human consciousness after death. So in addition to all the other things, uh, Sharon's a, a great researcher on near-death experiences and kind of between lives. So in, in yet that research, have you come across um, awareness of people of kind of like these, these different, like almost like a nexus of possibilities in one moment? Yeah, it does. It seems like, well, it, first of all, when people describe their memories of having uh, sort of charted out their life, planned out their life, it seems like there's a, there's a certain structure that's pretty set, but it's, it's sort of just this overall thing, like, you know, maybe, maybe these sort of points that you're talking about, uh, like, you know, like you're going to go, you know, maybe eight or 10 years in your life. And then this thing is going to happen at this one point. And then, you know, 10 years later, this other thing is going to happen. So that these really important like destiny points um, that are crucial to, to shaping your journey. And so in between there, it, and what I'm telling you now is, is based on several different uh, near-death experiencers sort of describing the question of destiny and free will and how these things interact. And, and what they seem to say is in between these things that are pretty much decided on that are going to happen, whatever you do in between there, you have room to kind of improvise and explore. And you, you know, you might choose a different way of, of, well, you're, you're trying to usually solve problems and figure out how to deal with things that have happened in your life. Um, and then when that experience comes to a close, then there's this new point that is just, it's going to like shoot you off into this new phase of your life. So, mm -hmm. so we have this ability to, to control our experience in certain ways and to, to influence our experience and, 
um, decide things for ourselves, but it's like the overall structure has has been decided by our our higher self or you know that that self in that other realm who said no these are these are the basic things that you that you need to accomplish and then you decide specifically how you'll accomplish those once you get down here yeah i think that's actually a, one of the more balanced uh, <laughs> explorations of free will and destiny and and it, it tracks with things that i've noticed with the astrology, but then also just with my intuitive work prior to doing the astrology is like, yes, we have, we, we, there are periods of life where we have a lot of wiggle room, it seems like. And then there are these like super highly charged moments where it's like, oh no, you, you need to meet this person. Like right. heaven and earth are going to move in order to have this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes, um, so let me, let me tell this story. Cause so this was one of those moments where it was like a destiny moment, but there was a, uh, a negative like destiny to it as well. So years ago, uh, when I was living in Paris, uh, this was, I was like in my uh, mid twenties and one night, and, and this maybe connects to your ideas of these like moments of like high energy, like these charge. So one night I was out with some friends, like eating dinner. And I just had this feeling well, there, there was like some jazz music on in the background, but I mean, that happens a lot, but I heard this music and I was just like, I need to go dancing tonight. And this is not something that I did. Like <laughs> I, like I'd maybe been out dancing like twice in my life. Like I gone swing dancing with somebody. So, so, but I was just like, I have to go do this. And I tried to get my friends to go. They wouldn't go. And the feeling was so strong. that I was like, I'm just going to go to this dance club by myself. Like, it, and that is something I had never done before. I've never done again. Like, I just don't go out on my own. But I went out that night and uh, went to this place uh, in Paris, this cool, you know, like basement swing dance club, the Caveau de la Huchette. And I'm like sitting there and I had been there maybe for half an hour or something. I danced with a couple of like, like grandpas that, <laughs> that swing dance there. And, you know, that was fine, whatever. The music was great. Uh, but then I like, I look over in the corner of the room and I see uh, these two young men come down into the room. And one of them just like, just my attention is just riveted on him. Um, and it's just like, I, I want to dance with him. But I like, didn't even like look him in the eye or anything. I just kind of like noticed him, felt that attention and then looked away. And a few seconds later, he comes over and he asks me to dance. And uh, it's wonderful. Like we spend hours dancing with each other. We get along very well. Um, and we end up um, spending the whole night together. And it's just like this amazing sort of, you know, Parisian experience. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, as we were saying goodbye the that next morning, I had this feeling in me that this was just supposed to be a one-time thing. This like, this wasn't, it wasn't meant to be any more than that. Like, I, I don't really know how I knew it, but I was just like, this is just, you know, so we just kind of said goodbye. I didn't even ask him what his last name was. We didn't exchange email addresses, nothing. Like we just went our separate ways. And I was like, that's just the way it's supposed to be. It was beautiful, wonderful. And now we go on with our lives. Well, a couple of days later, I'm like, man, we really should have like gotten each other's <laughs> contact information. I'd really like to see this guy again. Um, and he he was only in Paris for like a week or something. Uh, so, because he he was from out of town. And uh, so I was like, oh man, it's really too bad. But then I'm like going back to my my room. I was living in a dorm at that time. I was going back to my dorm at night and I was like, man, you know, maybe the universe just this once could like give me what I want. And maybe he would like, he would come by because uh, he knew where I lived and um, maybe he'll like leave me a note or something. And so lo and behold, I'm like thinking this, I go, I open my door to my room and there's a note that he had slid under the door. So um, he said, you know, if you're free, come down and meet me at the club again. So I went down there, we spent another wonderful night together. Um, and then at the end of that night, I was like, we need to exchange email addresses. <laughs> so as we're like parting, we like verbally give each other our email addresses. So a few days later, after, you know, he's left Paris, whatever, um, I'm like, I'm just going to email him and be like, that was a wonderful time. Thank you for this. 
So I send the email and it comes back undeliverable. <laughs> like, okay, did I like mishear something that he said? Cause like we're, you know, we both ha have access to speaking French. Like I was like, did I misunderstand something? So I like try a few things, nothing works. I'm like, huh, well, that's interesting. Um, and I try all these different ways to, to try to like track him down, but you know, I only have his first name in like the country where he lives. So it's a little bit hard. And um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it, I was really, I was really pretty obsessed with it for a little while. And at one point I remembered that the first night that we had been at the club, he had given his, his business card to the singer because he wanted to arrange for her to come um, to the country where he lived and, and perform. Uh, and so I was like, I'm going to find out who that singer is. I'm going to ask her for his email address or whatever. And I did manage to find her. I found her. I asked her about this and she was like, oh yeah, I remember him. He gave me his card, but I can't find it. She was <laughs> like, I've lost it somehow. Um, but if he writes to me, I'll let you know. And anyway, that's a long story, but the feeling that it left me with um, was that it was so completely absurd that we weren't able to connect with each other again. Like there were these ways that we should have been able to connect mm -hmm. with each other. We had purposely exchanged email addresses. Um, you know, I had found this other way to like find his email address and it didn't pan out. And I was like, it's so absurd that I, I was an atheist at the time. I was like, but it's so, it seems so orchestrated to prevent us from talking to one another that I almost believe in God because of this. Mm -hmm. And so it was just something that had that stayed in my mind for years. And as I think back on it now, I, I think back on the feeling that I had at the beginning and how I knew in part of me that it was just supposed to be this really brief encounter and I tried to get out of that and I tried to change it. And no, no matter what I did, that didn't work because I, I do firmly believe now, especially with all of the, the knowledge that I have from the, the research that I've done now, I do firmly believe that it was one of those destiny points and that mm -hmm. it was important for the two of us to interact at that time. And it did really, it did really help me in so many ways, just having that that very brief relationship with him um, sent me on this whole other trajectory over the following years. Uh, but it was not intended to be a long-term thing. And that was super frustrating at the time, but I'm very grateful for it now. And so, so I just kind of wanted to highlight how those, those, those relationships, like those destiny relationships can things can orchestrate really beautifully to bring them about and can also orchestrate really beautifully to take them out of your life. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And, and I see that a lot with people when they travel, you know, a lot of times people will go, especially to a foreign country, they meet somebody and it's like this amazing, you know, all the bells and whistles, you're like, Whoa, what are the odds <laughs> of everything? And then like, they never hear from the person again, or yep. it, it, like the same thing that you experience, where there's just block after block after block. And in looking at the astrology, usually those people have some kind of south node connection, which would be an indicator of like a past life connection, mm. and that maybe you've had some soul agreement to come together and like ignite the next phase. It's like this is a yeah. person who knows you in a totally different way than you're expressing in this lifetime. And so sometimes that person that you meet, it just, it's enough to like electrify you. And, and then you access this kind of dormant part that leads you forward. But oftentimes yeah. the level of orchestration is so intense that people are like totally starry eyed and, you know, like, oh, like, we're meant to be together. Right. Forever. We're supposed like, to be happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> no, it can be destiny and destiny can mean, you know, a very finite period of time. Mm -hmm. um, it can mean hours even just one conversation with somebody. And it doesn't have to be a romantic partner either. Cause sometimes it can just be like, I, I remember a conversation that I had with a, um, a professor wh while I was still a grad student that I just met at this one conference. And we happened to have a flight that was leaving around the same time. And so we both ended up in this cafe together and had this talk and it just, 
I have thought about it for years afterward. Um, it, it really, it really opened me up um, to a lot of things that I don't think I would have been open to if I hadn't heard somebody that I respected saying, yeah, yeah, these are, these are okay things to think about. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so yeah, it's, it's amazing the impact that those small moments can have and, and you shouldn't, yeah, you shouldn't dismiss the possibility that, Sometimes when you, when you feel a little nudge in a certain direction, you feel, you feel a little nudge to go swing dancing when you feel a little nudge to go get coffee at some particular place in the airport, that that might be your destiny pulling you onto something that's really going to, really going to help you in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, and you just reminded me, so the astrologer Liz Green, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of her, but she's done wonderful work, highly recommend any book by her. Um, but one of the things that she noticed, so she's a Jungian psychologist as well. And when she first started studying astrology, she was theorizing that the more conscious people were, the more they could deviate from the natal chart, kind of like the, the more, you know, oh, they're more conscious so they can exercise more choice over what happens in their lives. And what she found, and this agrees with what Uh, Carl Jung also found was that actually the more conscious people are, the more they become their natal chart. It's, it's Mm -hmm. almost like you, you're conscious. And so you're, you're aware of these odd planetary influences, even if you can't say, oh, that's Neptune, you feel it. And, Hmm. and like the little nudges that get triggered by, oh, the moon just passed your Chiron or, you know, Venus just crossed your North node. You're more apt to pay attention to those subtle details. And so, um, it's it's a weird thing because on the one hand, you're choosing to act on things, but on the other hand, if you go back and you look at the charts, like the transit charts and progress charts for that time period, it's really spooky where you're like, oh, are we just marionettes? Because like this trigger and boom, you did this. But um, But that is something that she's found that the more conscious people are and also I know a lot of astrologers have noticed this including myself that kind of like the older the soul or the more conscious path someone's on the more organized their natal chart is like you'll Hmm. see a lot more exact aspects whereas if somebody is a little more diffuse they they've got more uh, opportunities to diverge in this lifetime because things are less precise or less focused kind of mm -hmm. in yeah yeah very interesting So I've never thought of myself as a very intuitive person. And maybe that's partly because I had a very happy childhood that was very, uh, felt very safe and secure and didn't have to worry about any of that. Um, I felt very blessed uh, in that way. But learning to trust my intuition or even, even be aware of having intuitions was something that I came to much later in life. And it's something that's taken me a lot of practice of just being aware of how I feel about things and those sort of stray thoughts that pass through my head and be like, and and being able to notice what kind of energy those thoughts have. And one thing that I have learned to some extent how to do is to be aware of how things are changing in my career. So it was a really difficult thing for me to leave academia. Um, I felt a lot of trepidation about it because it felt like with the education that I had, staying in academia was, you know, the thing that you did. And that was, you know, the safe path toward a secure income and all those other things. So it was really hard to leave that, even though I like the the weight that was on me in academia, the the sort of just uh, feeling of constantly grinding through something that I didn't want to be doing was there but I didn't know at that time that that was a really good indication that I should go somewhere else. I mean, I did, I did figure it out and I did listen to that eventually, but it was a hard thing to do. And what I've learned in more recent career transitions is to be aware of that much earlier and to just be like, oh, well, this means that like, I need to pay attention. I need to probably need to make a change, do something else. Uh, And One thing that I've noticed too, and I'd like to hear if you have a a similar feeling about this, 
is that oftentimes now I can be aware that a change is supposed to happen, but a few, like, I don't know, a year, 18 months before it's supposed to happen. And, and that's, I guess, good in the sense that, well, I'm becoming more intuitive. I'm more aware of these things, but also it's a little bit frustrating because it means that I'm aware of it before it can actually be put into place. And so, for instance, most recently, this was about, uh, I don't know, two and a half years ago, I guess, I was still working a couple of part-time jobs to support my writing. And I had enjoyed them for a really long time. They were kind of a godsend to have these these jobs uh, that were flexible enough that I was able to do all this research and writing uh, on the side. But there came this point where I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. I I, I, my heart isn't in this, this, these jobs anymore. Like I really just want to write full time. I want to be able to focus on this. And I became aware of that, but then it was like, like in the next moment, it was like, I could feel someone or something telling me it's not time yet. You need to stay there for right now. And that was hard, but I was able to say, okay, I'll stay here till you to tell, till you tell me to do something else, or, you know, things line up in the right way. And then they, they did a year and a half later, and I can, we can talk a little bit more about that, but, but first let me just ask you, do you have that feeling of like, like you can feel those transition points coming like uh, a ways before it, do you find it frustrating? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. And, and mine are sometimes like eight years ahead of time. Like I, oh, I get them way out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and that is a weird thing. So, um, in, back in 2010, I, I got divorced and I left California. So I, it, I mean, we're not going to get into all the details of that, but filed for divorce finally on a blue moon. It, it was uh, December 31st. Once in a blue moon, you can yeah, be able to like, get okay, got to do this. And <laughs> in, in retrospect, I can see exactly why I had to do it and like why it lined up exactly then. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really eerie in the astrology, but um, one of the things that I kept seeing was, was this, and I kept calling it, it was like a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, which is like a biblical reference. Yeah. And, and I, and I'm not really like particularly into that, but that was just the imagery and the term that kept showing up. And I was like seeing this roar and hearing this roar and like this bright light coming at me. And I was like, I need to get out of California. Like I have to do this. <laughs> And, and I mean, it was urgent. It was like, I have got to do this and, or you know, like my life depends on it. And so I, you know, everything came together in this very synchronous, magical way, like boom, boom, boom. And, and like the day that I got divorced, that I filed the final paperwork for divorce, like all of these other things lined up, which like didn't reveal themselves as significant until many years later, but it was, I think it was like 2017 or something. Um, I, I had been living in Santa Rosa, California, which is where they had those like instantaneous fires that just like, you know, burn the neighborhoods to the ground in, in like five minutes. That was the neighborhood that I used to walk through like every day when I lived there. And as soon as I heard, you know, about the fires and I saw some footage and everything, I was like, oh, that was it. But I had basically had like PTSD for like eight years <laughs> for something that hadn't happened yet. And, and that's a weird state to live in when, yeah. you know, some tragedy occurs that you've been sensing and, and like, you feel relief. It, it does a real mind. Uh, <laughs> At least now body. it's over. We can yeah, move on it, to it, the next. <laughs> I've been like, experiencing it for eight years. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so like, you don't want to be a bad person and be like, oh, good. Like a tragedy occurred, but it's also kind of like, oh, good. I'm not insane. Like I was picking up yeah. on something for real. Yeah. And, and so like those feelings, they, they just disappeared. And I've, I've had that with other things. It's usually not quite eight years. Uh, you know, that, that was a particularly long time, but, but yes, um, lots of heads ups and, and yeah. what I notice is that, you know, a lot of times you get the heads up where Mercury is crossing your moon or the moon is crossing your Mercury in your chart, which happens, you know, once a month, the, the moon makes its way through the Zodiac. 
And so if I have a, a dream where I'm like, ooh, there's a message here, like I need to pay attention and I check transits, if that if Mercury is somehow involved, I take that message more seriously because mm -hmm. I just find that those messages tend to play out sometime in the future where it was a legit message. But that's been a process in my life of learning to trust that because especially when you're a little kid and you're seeing the reality very different from the people around you. I mean, I don't know yeah. about you, but like, I didn't know to be quiet. I, I learned pretty quickly, <laughs> but, but I, I would get in a lot of trouble because people would say, well, you know, this is what's happening. And I was like, no, it's not. And, and they'd be like, uh, yes, it is. And I'd be like, no, you're lying. Like, stop lying. That's not going to happen that way. And people would be like, you shut your mouth, you little smart mouth kid. And I'm like, yeah. but it's not going to happen that way. <laughs> like, it's going to happen this way. And you know, some of this stuff was many years, like decades later, where it it came to to happen. But yeah, it I do find that, and and oftentimes people don't keep track of exactly when did they have this idea. But if they happen to have a journal entry or something and have me check it out, yeah, usually Mercury mm -hmm. is involved in some way. Yeah. So. I had told you before this conversation, well, you had asked me before this conversation if there were sort of like moments and like destiny moments like that in, in my life because you were going to look at the chart. Um, so maybe it, those are related to this this story that I'm talking about. So, so, so I had that sensation that I needed to leave those jobs, but that it wasn't yet. So it was about six months after that, that like the feeling got like oppressive again. Like it was just like, I can't continue in this. I just can't do it. Um, and again, I got that feeling. No, you're supposed to, you're supposed to stay in it a little bit longer. So a couple of months after that, one of the jobs that I was in, um, my, I was assistant to a engineering entrepreneur and he told me that he had decided that he was going to retire a year after that. So, so suddenly I was like, oh, okay. So I get it. So I, I understand why I couldn't leave yet. So now at least I have like an end point. And when he told me that too, I realized um, that there was a similar end point for my other job um, as a, as a music teacher, I've taught private music lessons for many years and there was one particular student that had been with me almost the entire time that I had taught. Um, it was just a really um, special connection. And I realized that that student was going to be graduating at the same time that my boss was going to retire. And I was like, oh, that's that's the point. Where, that's the end point. That's the destiny point. That's when this is supposed to wrap up. And so it was a lot easier after that to go through that final year because I understood, you know, what the reason was for that final year. And I knew there was an end point. But the other thing is that as that year was going along, I, I still didn't know what I was going to do for income after this. Right. So, uh, I, I, I felt very clearly that I was supposed to make that transition, but I had no idea. I mean, you know, books just don't make you that much money. So there was no way that I could survive uh, just on my book sales. Well, it was, I guess it was a month before the, the end date, the, uh, the graduation and uh, retirement of my boss that I got this email just uh, somebody I had never heard from before. I didn't know them. They got, they sent me an email asking uh, if I would be interested in having a uh, financial support to write a new book. <laughs> I mean, there, there are a few other things that they also offered me support to do, but one of the things they were asking about is, you know, would you consider um, writing a book and us uh, giving you money to do that? So that happened on May 5th fifth of 2022 I guess it was because mm -hmm. this was yeah, just you, you a little me over a year yeah so you've you've yeah, got that exact um so that happened then and then it took a few months actually of sort of like talking with this person and negotiating the terms and and figuring out whether it whether the book that I wanted to write was really you know what this uh 
uh, foundation wanted to fund uh, took took some time working all of that out. But then uh, on August 12th of 2022 is when I finally got the notification that the grant had been approved. So uh, those were a couple of the those were the two main dates that I gave you as destiny points. So I don't know if you want to say something about what you see in the charts for those days. Yeah, so I, I have the charts printed out. And so May 5th, 2022, 622 p.m. Uh, is when you you got the notification mm-hmm. about that. I'm not going to say your location just because that's private, but I, I have it. And, and you need all three, uh, the date, the time, and the location in order to calculate some of these things that came up. But um, so the part of fortune of the moment was exactly conjunct your natal Neptune. And uh, the vertex was conjunct transiting Mercury, which is like the book, the information, the communicator, Mm. and your natal Mars, uh, which is a planet of action. And so um, there was also a collective experience that day where your transiting sun conjuncted uh, transiting Uranus that day. So in the sky, uh, those two met. And then your natal Chiron, which is like the wound, but also where we have uh, the potential to become the wounded healer or to kind of alchemize uh, challenges in our life, Uh, your Chiron was between that Sun Uranus conjunction and the transiting North Node. So again, that North Node destiny point comes into play and Uranus often comes in as um, a future orientation as well. So the part of fortune in a chart, like a lot of people don't even look at that because it's not oftentimes that active except when it is. And and I find that when there's like a really big event that maybe doesn't seem like it's that big of an event uh, when it's happening, but it's going to have a long-term ripple effect, oftentimes that part of fortune is somehow in play. And what I noticed for you which was fascinating given you know what your work involves right so there's the communication of ideas that mercury but then uranus is the higher level of of mercury so that's like kind of the weirder intuitive downloads that just show up out of nowhere um and then your chiron which i feel like the the work that you do is is very healing not just for yourself but also potentially very healing and grounding for people you know people that have mm-hmm. lost a loved one or people that have had um experiences that they can't explain a lot of times your research actually it kind of speaks to the rational mind and in a way that is able to allow that rational mind to explore some other things. So that just showed up and, and with it conjunct your natal Neptune, there's an implication there that there's a highly spiritual uh, component to whatever you're working mm. on. So I don't I don't know if you can tell what the topic of the book is or is that, Oh yeah. yeah, no, sure. It's it's um it's a philosophy book, so it's an academic philosophy book, but it is very much um, really connecting all of the different things that I have researched over the many different years. So there is definitely a spiritual component, but it's it's like you said, it's trying to make that interest uh, in in spirituality and other ways of knowing and uh, connection to uh, the deep value and purpose of existence to make that more palatable to the more rational analytical mind. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, so that was for the announcement of this possible book grant, but what was really interesting was when you actually found out that you, that it was approved. Mm. So, um, the sun was exactly conjunct your natal moon. So that's uh, that rational and intuitive. Like mm. you're, you're literally the, the <laughs> project that you're describing is wanting to take kind of the identity, the rational side, more the sun and, and like marry that more to um, an intuitive, more embodied understanding of reality. So there you have it yeah. right there. <laughs> and then um, Venus was very closely conjunct your North node destiny point. Um, Jupiter exactly conjunct your ascendant. Oftentimes when Jupiter conjuncts your ascendant, like there's, there's an expanding opportunity. There's a chance to, um, expand the way that the world views you, you and your work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also in the weeks leading up to this, 
Mars, Uranus, and the North Node all conjuncted uh, your natal Chiron. So again, that healing point, but mm -hmm. we've got two future oriented things, the, the Uranus North node, both future and then Mars, the planet of action, boom, right over there. That happened just like, I mean, when they were deciding who was going yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a lot of um, email traffic in those days preceding that. So that makes a lot of sense as well. And then yeah. in terms of destiny, this was like the one that I emailed you and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like this is blowing my mind. <laughs> so transiting Mars and transiting Neptune formed the base of what's called a, a yod with your natal Neptune. So that Neptune point, again, was emphasized in, in the announcement, mm. the part of fortune was there kind of indicating, hey, there's some kind of uh destiny level like this is going to affect your fortune in life and it has something to do with your natal neptune but where it really showed up was um this yod and in astrology the yod is also known as the finger of god <laughs> so it's oh, okay like, yeah I've, I, yeah i've heard of that yeah yeah so so at the base of a of this uh, isosceles triangle so it has two in conjuncts or what's also known as quincunx so it's 150 degrees um and so transiting mars was 150 degrees from your natal neptune and transiting neptune was also 150 degrees from that point so they were um, in a sextile relationship with each other and then pointing to your natal Neptune. That's like, mm. you know, in the Sistine Chapel, like, you know, that that image of like Adam and God touching, like, <laughs> that's pretty much like God's finger is pointing to your natal Neptune at the moment of this grant and saying, action here, action. <laughs> so. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Well, and then the other yeah. thing that, that I noticed was your progressed Mars. Um, so the progressed chart is how we evolve over time. Your, your natal chart is, I mean, you're born with that, that stays with you your whole life. But we also, we change as we age, right? It's not just transits to the natal chart. We also collect experiences and, and we shift. And so the progress chart adds one day for every year we've been alive. And it just kind of like creates a hypothetical chart. And your progressed Mars had just changed from Gemini into Cancer, like a week before you won this prize. And so Mars in Gemini and yours is in very early Gemini and the North node had crossed your Mars when you found out that you won that prize for Are the you talking about the, the big, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so your natal Mars had been active in this whole process as well, mm -hmm. but your progressed Mars, which is kind of how you get things done, how, how your passions are, um, with Mars and Gemini in the natal chart, it's very active. It's very mental. You can do like all kinds of things all at once, like the different jobs that you had playing out and all of that. Um, Mars and Cancer must be much more aligned with your emotions. And so if your heart just wasn't in your other work, it was going to become increasingly difficult for you to stay motivated and increasingly mm -hmm. difficult for you to get things done. So it sounds like you kind of got the heads up and, and like aligned your life and listened to the triggers so that once this occurred, you were now in a position where um, life was able to support you in, in getting things done, but in a different yeah. way. Yeah. And, and one thing I find fascinating too is the way that it, not only you know my own emotions and my own actions um, lining up in these ways, but seeing external events uh, sort of cooperating with me in these ways. So between that May fifth and that August twelfth, when I was sort of in that waiting period. I actually had several other projects that were proposed to me, paying projects that were proposed to me. So I was like doing all of these different things. I even I, some of it involved travel. Like it was just a lot of different um, events. It was all really interesting. They were all things that I was passionate about doing and was, you know, amazed that I was being, you know, remunerated to do at that point. And then as soon as I started working on the new book, all of that stopped. And, and I was just able to focus on this book. And that has been for the last nine months. Like I just, 
oh no we're in july that almost a year at this point like those things they came at that precise time when i needed things to fill in that gap and then and then they're gone and it, it will just allow me to focus on the book and it's it's just it, it perpetually amazes me how external events respond to what we need at that particular time and and respond to yeah those points of destiny or, or periods of destiny within our lives yeah fascinating and 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 i was you know behind the scenes like getting emails from you and stuff as some of these things were developing i wasn't checking transits all the time because i didn't know every, you know what was the precise thing but Um, But yeah, looking at this, it's like, oh, yes, there was a lot of stuff up and you were due for some kind of shift. I know when when my natal Mars, uh, my progress Mars rather changed from my natal Pisces to Aries, it was was like a giant change overnight because I mean, Mars and Mm. Pisces kind of wishy-washy is like, like it, it, you know, can't quite make decisions and you really have to align things with uh, you know, the proper spiritual timing of it. And, and there tends to be a real psychic preparatory element to it. And, and then it's like, oh, okay, this is the opportunity that I was waiting for. I can walk through that door now, but you can't do it before. Well, overnight, and I didn't, this is when I started paying attention to progressions. I, I went to Chicago, I visited my brother and my parents like flew back to Pennsylvania by way of Chicago. And so like we had kind of like a mini, you know, small family reunion going on there. And I, I came back from that trip to, I was living in Goshen, Indiana at the time and had this like huge yard project that I was trying to like tame into some kind of permaculture thing. And, and all of a sudden, like I had been waiting on um, there was like a community thing that, that we were doing and, and there were just like a lot of other sort of very diffuse projects where it was kind of like death by committee, like nothing <laughs> was happening. Yeah. And I came back and I didn't know that on the trip, my, my, Mar- my progress Mars had changed from Pisces to Aries, but I came back and I was like, let's get the weed whacker out. And I was just like <laughs> whack dandelions like <laughs> twice a day. And I mean, all of a sudden I was like super active and, and I was like, I'm not waiting for anybody to do this. I am just getting this done. And I like completely transformed the yard and like the people that had been sort of, you know, languishing in committee couple of years later I had them over I was like yeah come you can have a tour and they're like how'd you get all this done <laughs> like, I, but but it was my Mars like it, instead of being in this like sort of like oh I just have to go with the flow all of a sudden it was like hmm, I got yeah. stuff done so and you're specifically talking about the progress Mars is that what you're mm-hmm. saying yeah. yeah yeah so 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 that says what the would stay then 30 well no I mean 30 years in a particular sign or yeah it it depends on on like where so your natal Mars is in the one Gemini range and so your Mars was in Gemini for you know a good portion of your life like until you know basically last summer (laughs) so um but if your if your natal Mars had been at like 28 Gemini, then very early on in life, your progressed Mars would have been in Cancer. And so I just I, I should know exactly how long by progression, but I, I'm an English major, not a math major. So like I, I use the computer to do the calculations. But um, but progress Mars is one that I really watch because especially if it moves into something like cancer, um, all of a sudden your your way of doing things is very different Mm. and and it's like you you have to take those emotions into consideration and oftentimes things now have more of an incubating kind of feeling because cancer is the sign of the mother and and it's like you know in the crab shell it's a little more introverted whereas mars and gemini is like super active and you know you're you're able to juggle all these different projects at once so i find it fascinating that right in that same time frame you had all these other things, you know, multiple jobs and then these little short-term projects. And then that progressed Mars moved into cancer and all of a sudden focus. Yeah. So, yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. And so there was one other thing that I wanted to say, cause I think we're kind of getting towards the end here. Um, it, but something that I thought of very early in our conversation, when you were talking about the movie sliding doors 
and it talked about uh, everything changed because she missed a train. Uh, so there's this wonderful book by Andy Paquette uh, called Dreamer, 20 Years of Psychic Dreams and How They Changed My Life. Um, I recommend that to anybody. It's such a fascinating book. Um, and many of his dreams are really just his experiences in the spirit realm while he's sleeping. Uh, but he talks about specifically this idea of these destiny, he doesn't call them destiny points in our life, but of these different, you know, destiny points. And he uses the metaphor of catching trains. And he was like, you know, at a certain point, you know, you've, you're doing this certain thing in your life is, but you have to like wrap it up because you've got to catch the next train to go to the next place. And that's just a, an image that has always come back to me. Um, when I'm, yeah, when I'm thinking about the projects that I'm working on, uh, when I'm thinking, whether, you know, it's something that I'm really loving and I'm passionate about, or whether it's something that I'm starting to feel less energy about, but I always now keep in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, there's, there's probably another train to catch at some point. So we're going to, we're going to wrap this up at the right time. And then the next train will come along and we'll go off and do something else. And, uh, his implication, well, he's, he talked about, you know, you've got to catch the next train. He didn't talk about what happens if you miss the train when I go to the <laughs> church in the movie. So I don't know how how much things can get messed up, but I think, um, I mean, I do think that there are there are alternate ways of getting places and, and there, there are sometimes backup trains that could come along. Um, but there are moments when we are supposed to go through an important transition and there's, there's something new for us to do. And... And I think your your explanation of the astrology has helped to to make clear that there really is a very precise there's really precise timing involved there. And so even though and you can feel those energies shifting and you want it to happen now and you don't want to be in the uncertainty, like you want to know what's coming as soon as you're aware that it's coming, um, we do just have to a lot of times be patient and let it play out. And then it's just amazing to watch the way that all of those pieces ultimately fall into place. Yeah, for sure. And and I know for some people, the idea of destiny is kind of like, oh, well, why bother? Like if, if I, if I have to just do this, what am I just like a little robot? I go through life. Aww. But for me, it, it just, it continually astounds me yeah. in my own life, but also, you know, I work with a lot of people. So I'm tracking, you know, in some cases, stories that have been unfolding over years with people. And it, it's just fascinating to see how rich the stories are, even when you, yeah. you know, know what's coming along, just like, it's like a, you know, you watch a movie and you know, okay, you know, it's a rom-com, these two are going to get together at the end of the movie, or it's a thriller, okay, you know, they're going to catch the bad guy, like, it's like, you know, the plot, right, but you don't have the whole story, right, it, like, yeah, there's a whole lot in the execution of a novel, or the execution of a movie, or of our lives, and so to me, it's kind of like my art projects, right? Like I, I paint, you know, mm. there's a portal door, right? I, and I, I actually prefer painting doors to painting canvases because there are, you know, there's like a structure that you have to deal with. And for me, I just find that, um, I mean, I have four planets in Gemini. So, so, I mean, I could be all over the place, right? Like a little structure is nice, but I, I kind of think that it's, it's sort of similar with, with the astrology. It's like, you've got the natal chart, you got your transits, you got your progressions. That's like the door, but, but like, what are you going to paint on the door? And, and are you going to stay totally in the lines? Are you going to like spill over? Are you going to push against that structure in a way that, that allows Allows you to like really break free or are you experimenting with how can we do this in in like the most contained way possible so there's like infinite variety even with that structure oh, but yeah. the structure is comforting I find yeah I think so too it and I think people who think well you know if it's destiny then why bother uh, I, I think they're missing the point that the destiny is your friend. Destiny is there <laughs> in order to help you become what you wanted to become. Like you chose your destiny. Like <laughs> you're not aware of it now, generally, but 
but it is something that you chose, that you signed up for, that you wanted because of the way that it's going to help you grow and make you, and the things it's going to allow you to experience. And it's just, destiny is a, is a helping hand to get you where you may not even know that you want to go. But once you get there, you'll understand why Mm -hmm. you wanted to go there. So yeah, I I totally find it reassuring uh, to know that, yeah, that the, the events aren't just random, especially the ones that that seem negative or that are hard to deal with, that are really difficult transitions, just to know, yeah, you know, I've been through things like this before. Um, and there was there was always something, um, there's always a gift there inside of it. And and I can rely on that to be the case now as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I just find you particularly fascinating because having been in academia and, and knowing, you know, the, like, it's very mental. And, and so, I mean, the, the work that you're doing, I mean, it's, it's academic work in a way, like you're doing very thorough research and, and the ways that you're presenting things are, I think, accessible, but they're, they're very grounded in kind of like scientific research method and gathering information and analyzing it. But at the same time, uh, for you, you got a nudge to, you know, shift careers. For me, it took a brain injury. Like I I knew (laughs) academia is not for me. I'm not supposed to be doing this. I was having tons of dreams and I was just like, uh, no, <laughs> like that, <laughs> no. And so Mars and the sun conjuncted at my midheaven and boom, car accident. And I mean, it, it like that was just so uncanny how that happened because I, I mean, I had a sales job and, um, but I was just, you know, earning money so that I could go back into academia on my own terms and, you know, have a nicer apartment and like real furniture and not have to you know, be the yeah. student. And uh, yeah, life life had other plans and, and was like knocking very, very loudly. But uh, unlike you, uh, I, I had the like fateful accident that totally changed my life. And, and in the moment, I was like, oh, this was the answer. Like I, I had said, well, just make it happen. If it's so important, just make it happen. And like literally two hours later, I have no rational side and a brain injury and I can't read. So it's like, you're not going to grad school. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a, a warning to people like, you know, listen to your intuition, listen to those nudges, you know, because if you don't, then they're going to get louder and louder and louder and probably more unpleasant. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like your brain injury, th- there's, because of the way that it shut down the rational part of your brain, it almost feels like it was going to something like that was going to be necessary to open you up to the intuitive abilities the intuitive abilities that are your bread and butter now. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. My astrology mentor who I became friends with Ann Cryelkamp because she was really into permaculture and we both lived in Indiana uh, at the time, but I, I had her do a reading for me and she looked at my natal chart and she looked at my particular date and time and everything, all the details for the accident. And she said something to the effect of, because I I had gotten warning, like I was in a hotel that day and I knew that if I left the hotel, I was going to have a really bad car accident that day. But I was like, well, my work already thinks I'm crazy. I'm not going to like call them up and say, I had a funny feeling I'm going to have a car accident. So, you know, I can't, I can't leave the hotel today. Uh, I was like, that's not going to fly. But she said, if you had trusted that and you had stayed in the hotel, she's like, the ceiling of the hotel would have like fallen in on you, even if you like stayed in bed all day. She was just like, it was going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. Yeah. And and there are moments like that. And it's funny because the North Node, I saw this the other night when I was looking up our various events and uh, the North Node at that time was cr- like crossing the ascendant of the moment. So it was like screaming destiny. You know, it's like the moment, uh, how it presents to the world it was North Node right there. But what's mm. fascinating to me is that when I got married to my second husband, so many years later, like 18 and a half years later or something, the North Node was at exactly the same point. And, and that it happens to be my husband's Uranus. And so it was like, wow, you know, like it, 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 that kind of stuff just is mind blowing to me. And even though I see it all the time, I'm still like, wow, somebody 
it's really organized. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I like that way, but somebody is really organized up, up, <laughs> up there. God has a lot of different files, <laughs> it's like carefully <laughs> collating and all. That. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's pretty fascinating. No matter no matter where you look, I feel like in the universe, you you always find new layers of order, mm -hmm. and, and that's 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 part of what I feel like I am doing in philosophy and doing with this new book is just like trying to say look there's way more order out there than we have allowed ourselves to realize because it's because it's order that's not necessarily visible from a scientific perspective you have to have this more personal um intuitive perspective in order to to view it mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Well, that might be a, a good note to kind of wrap up on. I just looked at the clock and we've been talking for <laughs> over an hour now. So. We could probably talk for know, hours more. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today. Yeah. And how thank do you. people find you? Uh, on my website is a great way, SharonRollette.com. Rollette is R-A-W-L-E-T-T-E.com. Um, you can also find me on Twitter or Facebook. Um, Okay, great. And I'll link those below as well. So thank you again so much. This was wonderful. Thank you, Laura. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.